Hi there, I'm Dave Butler. I'm Emily Freeman. Welcome to Don't Miss This. We're moving through the scriptures. It's our scripture podcast. If you are new, this time we're in the New Testament. And by this time, I mean this year. <laughs> and this time we're in the, the book of Acts. We're starting the book of Acts. So we just kind of, we're at the halfway point, I guess, through the New Testament this year. It feels longer than halfway for some reason, but it's like, oh, it really is only halfway through the year. Yeah, I feel we like just it's finished November the Gospels. Right That's why it's, we're at the halfway. We're, are we really halfway yeah, through? June. I know. Well, okay, we're halfway yeah. through calendar-wise, but page count. No, 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 no. Yeah. There's more time for less pages in, yeah. the, in the Gospels, yeah. rightly so. Yeah, because we um, love to Some like, days switch gospel the gospels stories. to go all the way to like August or something. Can't you do something about that now? <laughs> like, we should spend more time. <laughs> we love the gospels. Yeah. We could spend a whole year on the gospels. Yeah, but it's, and, and it actually is, I mean, this is going to be almost sound dumb to say, but you have to, you have, you have to begin with the gospels. Um, and particularly when you get into the book of Acts, which we're starting today, um, we named today Act 2 because... That's clever. This is the book of Acts, y'all. <laughs> but also because it really is, uh, most Bible scholars think the book of Acts was written by Luke as a second part to the book of Luke. That they should have been read together. Hmm. That like you read the book of Luke and then you read the book of Acts. And it's just the same story, essentially. But this is Act 2. And the story continues, which we love. Right. The story continuing. Yeah, and you and you would uh, and you'd miss out. You have to know who this Jesus is as you come into the book of Acts. In fact, that book is called the real life name. It's called the Acts of the Apostles. Mm -hmm. And in my other paper scriptures, I changed it to say the Acts of Jesus through the <laughs> Apostles. <laughs> and I was like, because that's really what this this book is. It's about. It's just like, oh, now watch. The ministry of Jesus continue, but from heaven. You're almost seeing like the way you and I live life right now is what you're going to find in the book of Acts. Yeah, like how and, Jesus interacts. Well, and, and that's what I was going to say. And, it's so fun to look and be like, this is what a life with Jesus should look like. Right. A and they were so used to having Jesus right there. And then we watch what does it look like to keep that close of a relationship with Jesus this way, you know, vertically right. instead of horizontally, because they still continue to keep that same as if he were present mentality. Yeah. And he is. And you see that. And it's like, it's powerful because when you read the gospels, you're like, oh, here's the presence of Jesus when he's walking down the road with you and eating lunch together with you and all those things, which lucky ducks, you know, they got to experience that. And it's like, Okay, now start watching how you experience and see the presence of Jesus and the power of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus, like um, almost as if we're going to experience it right now. Yes, which is so fun. So we're going to dive right in in one of our favorite parts. Oh, oh this. Yes. Okay. Okay. This is so fun. Look at both of us. Yeah. Like, oh, wait, <laughs> wait. This is so fun. <laughs> oh, God, we um, put it there. The tip-ins. Um, are going to work like this for the rest of the year. If you have the tip-ins, one of the things we wanted to do is talk to you about each of the books that we're going to be reading through for the rest of the year, who wrote it, when it was written, but and who the audience was, who, who the book was written for. But then also at the bottom of every one, as we go through the books, we for sure have favorites. Um, just the parts that we think you don't want to miss when you get there. And so this year we'll hit all of these favorite parts. But when you come back to the New Testament in years from now, you might go to that tip in and say, okay, what are the best stories that I would want to spend time in from the book of Acts? And they're going to all be listed right here. So you can just kind of keep hold of them. So it's like a table of contents essentially for, yes, for our every favorite book. parts for each of the books. Yep. So, so you'll see that for all of them as we go through. But So you talked about Luke wrote it. It's the second part to the Gospel of Luke. Um, it's traditionally dated between AD 60 and 65. And the emphasis is on how the Holy Spirit empowered believers and moved within and enlivened the church as a whole. And then it records all the missionary activities of the early church, which is so fun. And, and you'll watch that. You can watch the numbers in these first few chapters, which I think is so fun. 
Yeah, he actually, it's kind of fun who he addresses it to. Verse 1, Acts 1, verse 1, to this guy whose name is Theophilus, who could have been a real guy that he was writing the letter to. But some people take this approach because that word Theophilus means friend of God. And so uh, some people take the approach and say like, well, this letter actually is written to anyone who considers themselves a, a friend of of God. And I think it's actually cool that he's writing to people who don't know the story, but are still calling them a friend of God. Yes. Even if you've never heard of Jesus before, we're actually going to start on day one considering you a friend of yeah, God, even if you don't if, know his story. If you open this, then just by the fact that you opened the pages, you hey became friend. a yeah. friend. Day yeah. one. Hi, friend. Yeah. It's so fun. It's sort of the idea. So he tells you the, the former letter I wrote was all that Jesus began to do and teach. And that word is so rad. The gospels are everything that Jesus began to both teach and do. But buckle up because he's not done. Yeah. He's not teaching and he's not done doing. And he says that goes all the way up until, you know, this certain point where we're going to start the book of Acts. But he uses this phrase in verse 3 which is um, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion. And that word passion is not a word that Latter-day Saints typically use to talk about the atonement and resurrection of Christ, but it's a word that a lot of traditional Christians have adapted to talk about what you, what Latter-day Saints might normally say the atonement of Jesus Christ is often used the passion of Jesus Christ. Those three events of Gethsemane, the cross and the tomb that after that passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And he just talks about this. This phrase is so neat. These infallible proofs that he showed himself. We knew him. We saw him. We like he was there. We were certain of it. And they just have these infallible proofs of Jesus really was a central character in our, not the story, but our story. And for them, it was, you know, um, like he showed up and talked to him on the road and, yeah. and, and everything. And they felt the prints in his hands. But the question in the journal is just, I think, a, a neat opportunity to think about like, okay, again, maybe looking back over the last, you know, six months of the year, or over your life, or whatever it is, like, what are your infallible proofs? And it would be so fun to do that in a Sunday school class, to just start out the class and say, what's your infallible proof that Jesus is real, that he's part of your story? We did something similar in our Sunday school class this week. Um, The woman who was teaching asked us what we know about Jesus. And It was so fun to watch how many hands went up just immediately and how important it is to just remember, these are the things I know about Jesus because I've actually experienced them and to speak them out loud and to to have that moment. I was sitting by my grandson, Kingston, and he knows how much I love Jesus. And he kept saying to me, Nana, your hand, raise your hand. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. He kept saying he was so excited for me to like talk about my friend, you know, and um, to talk about those things. And I wonder, even with like my seminary class, that was something we did a lot where I would say, look back over the past 24 hours or over the past week and where did Jesus show up in your story? If we can find and speak to those infallible proofs, even still today, it becomes a really powerful testimony builder, I feel like. Yeah, and and it's neat because those are the things they have experienced, but to speak them is almost a, a way, an invitation to now continue to look for them in the future also, to just say, like, this is what I've seen so far. That's my past. And now it almost builds an anticipation. Yeah, this is what I can expect. Yeah, yeah, for what's to come. In fact, that's what happens when they all are gathered on the Mount of Olives and Jesus goes up, you know, into the clouds um, and leaves them, he says, with a promise of the Father. And in verse 4, they're all there when he goes up and and they're all just waiting there. And and Jesus says to them in verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and into all the parts of 
the world. Like we've experienced it together. Now go out and tell the world about that. And then he goes up into a cloud and they're all just <laughs> looking up. It says steadfastly in verse 10 into heaven. And then all of a sudden these two angels come down and there says, hey, you men of Galilee, why are you gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. And I think in some part he might be talking about the second coming, but I also think he's talking about in the same manner, in the same kind of power and, and presence, he's going to show up in your story. So go now, go out into the world and be witnesses of this. And I think it's so important for us to remember, we talked a lot about condescension. Um, we've talked about it within the Book of Mormon, and then we talked about it even just around Christmas and, and the fact that Jesus really did come down. He met us where we are, as we are, but he didn't intend to leave us where he found us. That was never his intention. And the ascension reminds us that he intends to take us up to where he is, as he is. And I think we sometimes forget that's part of our doctrine, that that ascension wasn't just something that happened on page 1366 of the New Testament. I, I feel like those angels were also saying this in like manner of what has happened here. This is your potential. This is your capacity. This is now this is what you're trying to do is allow him to transform you and help you to become like he is and as he is so that you can return. And that's going to be a great work that we can't accomplish on our own. We're actually not capable of accomplishing that on our own. Yeah, I was actually just reading from a, a Bible scholar, N.T. Wright, um, really well-known Bible scholar, where he, sa he actually says the reason that they're going to keep bringing up the idea of resurrection, they'll keep witnessing of his resurrection over and over and over again, is because Jesus' resurrection is an example of what God intends to do with the whole family of God. Like the work of that grand, restorative, exalting plan of the Father, it's like, oh, there, look, here's a witness of it. It's begun. Hmm. Like it be, it's like started, like, and there it is. And so you'll see that in the beginning of Acts. And he thinks the same thing that you do, that it's just like, oh, that's actually his like way of saying, you see that? That's my intention with all of you. Yes. And I love when the angels are just like, uh, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? Almost as if he's like, there is a great work to be done yeah, now yeah. and and go, like get up and do it and, and let's see what's about to happen now. And I think it's, it's cool, like it's good to look back and see infallible proofs, right? To look back on our experiences, to have memories and to like be encouraged by those memories. But I also do love that call from angels to say like, I know, I know it's so fun to look steadfastly into what was. But let's go have experiences in the future yeah. also. Let's anticipate them and, and live and continue to live out this story. And I love in verse 8 when it says, You shall receive power, and after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And one of the things that the book of Acts is going to teach us is what it looks like to have the Holy Ghost come upon you, which I think is such a powerful lesson. In Acts 2 is one of the best places I think to go to learn about the character of the spirit and the attributes of the spirit and, and what that and looks the effects, like in a the life. the effects of the, yeah. Yeah, and we, we call that like a wildfire. Um, this is going to be the journal page from this week. And what you'll see if you turn to this journal page, and this might be a really fun one to use if you're working with the youth, is um, these things. When has the spirit poured out in your life? When has the Spirit filled up? When has the Spirit caused you to ask what to do? When has the Spirit spoken in your own language? When has the Spirit shown wonders? When has the Spirit sat upon you? Because so often I think the youth ask, and we all do, but we hear it particularly from the youth as we travel all around and talk to the youth. How do I know if it's the Spirit? How do I know it's not just me? or my mind, or what is happening with me. And there are several places we love to take the youth into 
when we are talking about the Spirit and how the Spirit works in a soul and in a life. And this is one of the places, Acts 2. Another place um, that we love is Doctrine and Covenants 11, that whole chapter, and Romans 8, that whole entire chapter. You could teach an entire lesson if you chose to from Acts 2 on learning to recognize the Spirit, and you might pull some of those things in. But let's read through and just watch and look for all of these words that you're going to see on this worksheet. Remember, the worksheets you can find in the newsletter and on the app if you want to just print those directly from your phone. Um, you can. They're also in the journal. And this is called the Day of Pentecost, which is a, a day or a phrase that is not as familiar to us. It is it's really familiar in a in the traditional Christian churches. Um, but this is a day when the Spirit was just poured out. And I love watching for all of these words. It tells us... And it's, and it's fun. That this day, Pentecost, is that penta means the 50. It's the 50 days after Passover. So it was, for the Jews, another festival. And it was one where they celebrated... Um, the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. And they and tradition says that the whole mountain, like when the law was given, like um, flowered, you mm -hmm. know, and became really beautiful. And this was God pouring out his like, his relationship with the people. So it's awesome that this happens on a day for a bunch of Jewish boys when they're yes. like already celebrating. Like, yeah. yeah, and it wasn't, it didn't, this celebration didn't begin on this day. It already was tradition, which I, Love that just on what would like be God a picked. high holy yeah, day yeah. that he was like, oh, and everyone, it tells us they were all with one accord in one place already. Everybody was already there. And in verse two, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house. And I, there's a couple of things that I love in that verse. First, that the spirit can come suddenly. We should expect that would be true, that there will be moments when we just suddenly are filled with the Spirit. But I also love to think about that word. It tells us in verse 2, it filled all the house, but in verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. That's something um, that would help us recognize the Spirit is that it fills us. It, it doesn't leave us empty. The Spirit fills. So that's one thing you might recognize from the Spirit. Um, I also love in verse 6 when it talks about, Now this was noised abroad. The multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And, and we also talk about speaking with other tongues. And I love this thought about the Spirit being able to reach us in our own language. Mm. Now, sometimes we think about that as like all of a sudden everyone could speak Spanish or German or Portuguese or French or, and sometimes that does happen. That is sometimes what speaking in tongues is like. But I learned a really profound lesson when each of our boys was set apart for their mission. And we had boys who served in Spanish speaking Georgia. Croatian speaking in um, Croatia. <laughs> and it, it, now it's called the Adriatic mission, but it was the Croatia mission that he was called to. Um, then we had one go to English speaking Colorado and one go English speaking to Indiana. And um, of the four, two of them were blessed in their setting apart from the stake president with the gift of tongues. And the crazy thing is, it was the one going to Indiana and the one going to Colorado who both were speaking English. Mm. And when the first one, when it happened, the first one who was going to Colorado, I was like, the state president must have forgotten where he was going. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. You know, you just, <laughs> it's fine. He's not learning a language. And when we walked out, Garrett said, I, I must be going to learn a language on my mission because I was blessed with the gift of tongues. Um, but when it happened again with Ian, when he went, I was like, okay, maybe I don't understand the gift of tongues mm. because mm. those were both English speaking missionaries who already speak English. And what was really interesting about listening to them right home 
is how they were tutored to not only hear and recognize the Spirit, but to also help other people hear and recognize the language of the Spirit. And, and they would teach how the Spirit spoke to them, but then also how it would speak to other people. And I think that's important to remember when the Spirit speaks to us in our own language, that might be football, that might be math, that mm -hmm. might be how to better mother one of your children who you are really struggling with. Um, that's your language right now. That's mm -hmm. where you need help right now. And I just, I love the fact that don't limit the spirit by accident. Yeah. Let it be as big as it needs to be. And what language, what, what language do you need right now? What words do you need right now? That's how the spirit is going to reach out to you, which I love. Um, then you get to the part in verse 17 that I love. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And then again in 18, and on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit. So first of all, we learn the spirit can fill up. But I love also that the spirit can pour out. Yeah. And, and I think that part's extra cool because... I mean, he's quoting the book of Joel and he's answering, Peter's answering back in verse seven, everyone's like, they're all amazed and they all marvel. Everyone who's watching what's happening. And they're like, aren't these just Galileans? And it makes me just think about Jack about to go on his mission and all his buddies about to go that like someone might look at what they do. Or you were talking about that missionary who came home and, and you would just, mm. you can almost hear someone say like, isn't she just a 20 year old? Isn't yeah. he just a, a you know, a, a Lehigh boy or whatever? And, and just to see like what can happen when, the, when someone has the spirit of God with them. And, yes. and everyone's like, you guys are like the country folk. How are you like so influenced? Like, why is this happening? And then he says to, J quotes Joel and he says, well, the prophet Joel prophesied that one day the spirit would be poured out on sons and daughters, on handmaids, on the normal people, on the unexpected, that that this is what you, he said you should expect to yeah. actually happen. Which I love. And, and I think one of the things that we've talked about a lot and one of my favorite studies we did last year is when we talked about um, that thought about what does the spirit look like and how does it work in someone? And so often the spirit might, uh, how do we say, be the opposite of what you would imagine. This, a really great place to see that is here. Sometimes we teach the spirit is a still small voice. That's really common for us to teach. And true. Yeah. And, and it's true. But in chapter two, um, verse two, it tells us it was the sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. That's really loud. Yeah. I've heard a rushing mighty wind. We live in Lehigh. The wind is so loud here. Or Sometimes you'll talk about how still the spirit is, but it also can be compared to the sound of um, rushing waters is sometimes. And if you've ever stood somewhere, Greg and I last year were in Europe and we stood where the waters were just rushing down out of the Alps and we couldn't even talk to each other. The sound was so loud. And so I think that's something else that's important to teach to people. The spirit can fill up but it can also pour out. Mm. It might be a still small voice or it might be the sound of mighty rushing wind. Like it's important to start realizing, we did a whole class on this on our master class, um, which I can't even remember what the name of it is. Living a God-led life. Yeah, living a God-led life where we just showed the paradox of the spirit could be this, but also, it could be this. So if you're only expecting the Spirit to show up one way, sometimes it helps to really open up and see the Spirit could do this, but also this. It could do this, but also this. All of these things could be true. Yeah. If you're interested in that study, you can find it on our website, don'tmissthisstudy.com, and that can guide you through it. Um, otherwise, I think I would just pay attention as you particularly move through the book of Acts to see what does it look like for people to live this God-led life? Like, what's it look like for a normal Galilean, a normal person, a regular mom, a businessman, or whoever? What's it look like when all of a sudden they live with the power of God, the Holy Spirit in them, like moving? And, and I think 
Whatever someone's story starts off as, the end in verse 11, will it'll end with the wonderful works of God. Like it'll end with people marveling and being amazed like of what can happen in a life when someone lets like the spirit take the reins essentially. Yeah. And you love that we do see that in 37 when after all of this happens, it's poured out and there's this fullness and all this stuff is happening. What, what it prompts is this question, what shall we do? That's the prompter there. And then the spirit starts working within them of what they are meant to do there. And it's those people who heard and watched this happen that they're the ones who ask, like, man, what shall we do? And don't you kind of feel like that sometimes, like you sit in church and you hear someone who's living a godly life, who's like filled with the Holy Spirit, and it leads you to ask the question, like, wait, how do I, how do, I do that? Like, I, you know, like a mission, that missionary you talked yes. about come home and you hear his talks and you're like, I want experiences like that. I want the God to use me in that way. I want, you know, I want to live that kind of life. And he, the simple answer is turn to Jesus, be baptized mm -hmm. in his name, like commit. Remember that to be baptized in his name means commit your life to him. Turn away from that other life you were living and turn to a life of following him and you'll receive that same gift. And in 39, the promise is unto you and to your children and to people who are far away who haven't heard this yet. Like this is a, God is so generous and liberal in giving this promise and this kind of life to any and everybody who wants it. Yeah, and I, the only thing that you have to do to earn the privilege of the Spirit or the Holy Ghost is that daily repentance, right? It's just um, continually turning to Him and, and living that covenant of baptism. And I love this thought of repentance because we see in verse 40, one of our favorite things, we love to teach with repentance. It's just a turning toward. That's what it is daily. It's daily turning toward Jesus. Yeah. That's how you receive the Holy Ghost. It's so easy. And I love when he says in verse 40, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Mm. Um, right. It's, he's telling you, you got to turn toward you, repent. You got to turn toward. And in order to do that, you're going to have to walk away from an untoward generation, Yeah, which is, don't you think that's awesome? It's a cool thought. It's a cool word. Yeah. You it's know? so awesome right there. Um, so that is one of our favorite parts of this lesson is just what do you learn about what the spirit looks like? And when has the spirit poured out, spoken in your own language, shown wonders, sat upon you, caused you to ask what to do and, and filled you up? Um, such a great lesson. Yeah. Okay. You, now you just get to watch. So remember he says at the beginning, all these things that Jesus did teach and all these things that Jesus did do. You got to see Peter and the other apostles kind of teach the way Jesus taught. And now in chapter three, you get to see some of the apostles do the things that Jesus did mm -hmm. or would do. And this story is so awesome. And P.S., the Bible video that they made of this one, that the church made of this one, um, is so good. It's one of their, it's one of their best ones. Yeah. It's like really the, super useful. It wins usable. the award. Yeah, it wins the award. Mm -hmm. Some of them are not my favorite. Not, I mean, that's fine. <laughs> we all have our opinions on movies we like, don't like. It's all fine and good. This one though, I'm like Oscar. Um, <laughs> so this chapter is they go to the temple at the hour of prayer. And this is so neat to think about, by the way, that everyone gathered to the temple at the times of prayer and when the priests would go in and offer the incense and go up. And I just think, oh, that's so rad. And my spirit is drawn to that. And then yesterday I was like, bro, you're doing it. Like I, when I went to church at 1.30, you know, with everybody else, like it was like, oh, we have an hour of prayer also where we <laughs> gather together. And it's it's so neat to, I, I feel like, be a part of that. P.S., when we did that, we had a missionary go off Um uh, give a farewell in our ward. And uh, and the man who said the closing prayer, it's going to make me teary even like thinking about it, like stood and like, like prayed a blessing on all our missionaries. And he, and he talked about our family, our neighborhood family sending off these missionaries. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh man, this book of Acts also will emphasize the heart and soul of Christianity is a faith community. 
yeah. is people gathering together to pray in the name of Jesus, to break bread together in the name of Jesus, and to care for one another in the name of Jesus. And don't miss that as you read through this. Like we just live in a really, really individualistic society right now where there's an overemphasis on I can have my own time with God. And that is true. And people should connect personally, but there's something about kingdom community. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it's a beautiful thing. And, and you see that here, people gathering together at the hour of prayer. And when you understand and have felt and tasted the sweetness of that, your heart goes out to this man who's been for decades brought daily to the gate beautiful. And I'm so happy it happens at that gate. It really yeah, could have too. happened to any gate, yes. but there's a gate in Jerusalem called the Dung Gate. And I'm just happy this, happy this miracle didn't happen there. <laughs> it happens at the gate beautiful. And, and mm. I don't know who's bringing him every day, but I love that person. Yes, They bring him every day to this gate and he, and he asks for money at the gate and he's, he's lame, his, his legs don't work. And so he doesn't ever get to go in to the hour of prayer with everybody else. And you watch starting in verse four, and I just want you to imagine to yourself that Peter for three years has watched Jesus and the way he treats people and handles situations. And now it's almost as if he looks down at his wrist and sees his bracelet, WWJD, <laughs> you know, and thinks to himself when he walks up and sees this man, okay, he's not here, but he's in me. And what would he do if he were here? And, and you just, um, and I just want you to think that as you come into this and fastening his eyes on him with John, he says, look on us. And don't you just love that that happens, that fastens his eyes on him as if he's the only person in the whole world, like Jesus would do. Jesus loves the world. We'll sing about it all the time. But, but that woman on the roadside felt like she was the only one. Mm. And, and so did the dad who brought his little boy to him. You know, like people felt like he, tr like in that moment, his eyes were fastened on them. And he says, look on us. Like, let, let's look at each other. Uh, and, and he did expecting to receive something. I know. Of I love that line so much. Don't yes, you? Yes. That I word. Do too, that I just, you think about it that like he looks up expecting for some goodness to come from them. And it just, it makes me think of President Nelson, that we are meant to seek and expect mm, mm. good things. And I love that this man, he, he expected probably money. Yeah. You know, that's why he, that's what he was used to getting. Right. And don't you love too, that we can't even begin to assume what that expectation should be because yeah. he definitely wasn't expecting what was about to happen. Right, right. And that's all true of all of us, right? Yep. It's like, oh, you expected to receive this from God. Just prepare yourself to be surprised, <laughs> you know? And Peter says that great line in verse six, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give thee. Whatever I have, I give you. And the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, and he lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received their strength. That's so cute to me that it's like just his feet and ankle bones. <laughs> this is like really tender to you right now, Emily, about <laughs> receiving strength in your feet and ankle bones. <laughs> it's tender. <laughs> and he just immediately they received, he received strength. And verse eight is awesome. And he leaping up stood and he walked and entered with them into the temple. That part is so awesome that they go in together. But that part, he's walking and leaping and praising God. And I just think there is something so sweet about that. I love that like most people's first steps are wobbly, like Bambi, you know. <laughs> but his first steps are actually not steps at all. <laughs> they are jumps and they are leaps and they are dancing. And it's like, this man has been lame on those steps, waiting and wanting for 40 years, you later find out. And like that, he goes to leaping. And, and I think that's remarkable. I think it's remarkable that that great of a change can happen in someone's life that quickly. Habits might take their time to change and culture and, and I get a, a journey, but like there can be an immediate change of spirit when Jesus enters into our lives. We can go from lame to leaping 
that quickly, at the mention of his name mm. even. And uh, I think this is a beautiful story. Um, and it causes a, a major scene <laughs> with yes. people, everybody who's yeah. there. You know? and, and I love when you look at this. Um, I, I love to look at scriptures and think, okay, what, what can I learn from this now? Yeah. today. What, yeah. what, how could this be part of my story now? And I, it's such a great lesson on what ministering mm -hmm. looks like. Um, because think about these steps. First of all, he looked, uh, he saw the need. He, he went over, like he met him in that place. Second is what he brought. He brought Jesus. Yeah. That's what he brought into that moment. And, um, and I, don't you love that part where he lifts him up? Yeah. Like that is part of ministering. It's just bring Jesus and lift. That, that's it. That's all you need to worry about. Jesus will do the rest. And, and that thought about that covenant, they walked with him. It says into the temple, but in the covenant, I want to think about in that ministering relationship, that covenant ministering, they walked with him is such a neat thought. And then, don't you love this part at the very end? It says um, in verse 11, and as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch, which is called Solomon's greatly wondering. Mm. And that word held to me is such a sweet word. Yeah. You know, is that sometimes we just hold each other through. That's what we do. And I think again about, we had this missionary who came and we had a homecoming. You had a farewell. Well, we had a farewell at a homecoming. So it was an amazing sacrament meeting. But um, this missionary spoke in our ward and he talked about how much he struggled through the first parts of his mission. Um, in fact, one day praying every 15 minutes that God would hear him and strengthen him. And by the 43rd prayer of that day, was on his knees in the back room, and the Spirit just said to him, don't think about yourself. Start praying. You've only prayed about yourself so far today. Start praying about someone else. Mm. And that is what got him through. But the sweetest part about that is when he got a companion several months later, who was sobbing in his bed. And for 38 days, he sat with that boy and held him through. Mm. Uh, and he walked him through what, how he had gotten through his 38 days. Um, he walked him through. And he said, this is where we start. Uh, this is my favorite part. He said, at companion study, I will be in charge. I will preach Jesus. Mm. And we're going to start with his atonement. And I'm going to teach you what his strength looks like. And I just love that thought about holding someone through. That's ministering. And, and that's what happened here is that they just held on to each other in that covenant relationship of ministering and healing came. Well, and it's sweet to me that, that God allows us to play a part in the miracle. You know, like mm -hmm. he, Peter lifts him up and then he receives his strength. That, that he gives us a part of that and 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 again, maybe bringing us about again and emphasizing that idea of kingdom community. Yeah. It's like the miracle happens as as we love and minister and hold on to each other. Mm. Like that's where you see Jesus coming in is yeah. when you know that th they're together. One who's seen him with infallible proofs, one who hasn't, and God brings them together. Yeah. And then it'd be fun to see now where the man who sat at the gate beautiful will do that for somebody else. Yes. That's a story we're missing, but we know it's there. Yeah. Um, this name of Jesus is one of our favorite things to talk about. And I love when you study that word name when you look it up in um, Hebrew, it talks about, it can also be read as um, taking upon you the name of Jesus, taking upon you the character of Jesus, taking upon you the, the, oh, yeah. um, the authority of Jesus. And, oh, and you'll see it in the Greek also. We pulled this verse, Acts 3, 6. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. And I love that... Peter didn't really have anything. He didn't have money. 
He didn't have anything nice he could offer, but what he had was Jesus. That's it. That's what he had. And, he not, and, and it's cool that he doesn't speak just in his authority, but in his character and as an, in his an expression. You know, someone yeah. could have seen that scene and said, I see Jesus in what's just happened there, yeah. you know, is, yeah. is what they could say. And, and it's interesting that he teaches that to everybody when everyone asks, like, how did you do that? How did you, like, how did that come about? And his explanation is all in that chapter four um, that you can read. Read that chapter four, and it's just powerful and beautiful. He talks about what, how that happened. You know, like everyone else just thinks it's like this. This guy's been like lame for forty years, and and this sort of thing shouldn't be happening. And and he just it teaches them. He's like, no, it was Jesus. I'm telling you, like, it, I spoke the name of Jesus, and and all of this happened and mm -hmm. he's just teaching them no it wasn't us it was him yeah and there's power in his name or in his authority this could have read in the authority of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up and walk it could have been translated as that from the Greek translation but I love when it says in the name of Jesus Christ it reminds me of that CES talk by Elder Rasband that we love so much and he talks about in, in someone's greatest need in, in that moment of darkness or um, that desperate moment, just saying the name of Jesus Christ will bring rescue yeah. and deliverance. And it's just, it's so simple. The power in the name of Jesus and the authority and the character of Christ, sometimes we forget that yeah, and, and we've lost that a little bit in the Western world. If you read writers talk about what it was like in, in these days, that there was power in speaking a name. Mm. And we have a little bit of that still lingering in our Western way of thinking. Like, uh, like if you wanted to, um, you could say like, oh, mention my name and they'll let you in. Yes. You know, or something yes. like that. That yeah. like we still have. Say David sent you. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. there's still some of that that lingers that all of a sudden the situation changes when you mention a name. But there is a lot to it. And it was, it was, they, they held on to that belief really powerfully and, and strongly here. Um, but he, cha he adds something to it. Peter does when he talks about the story and he adds in that there was faith in that name. Mm -hmm. You know, that the mention of the name is powerful, but there was belief in that name and there was trust in that name. And mm -hmm. there was, we engaged in it. We didn't just say his name. We personally got involved in it. And, and the, the verse that kind of teaches that really well is he says this to them in, in Acts 4, 10, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at the knot of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Remember that, that he's the one that you thought was going to be a useless part of the building and actually ends up being the cornerstone. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But then there's this line that says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And I think there's something really powerful about that. That's like, there is authority and power in the name of Jesus. But really the, the, the thing that brings power, the thing that makes us influential in the name of Jesus is that we've been with him. Yeah, right? which that, I love. That pattern of living with him is actually what brings, increases our influence and, and our ability to bring his presence and power into a situation. Yeah, and then talking about it right. after, which um, is kind of where we end up. We love in 542, but I'm going to take us back into four as we talk about this, but um, in 542, it talks about that daily, both in the temple, but I love when it says, and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus. And just that thought of preaching Jesus, of doing, is there a picture after this? Yeah, of him preaching. Um, there is this, <laughs> I didn't know what was going to happen just then. Um, there is this, um, 
worth or, or the importance of speaking that out loud when you see him in your story, when you experience that happening, not just having that personal experience and pondering on it, but there is a power in actually witnessing of what happened there. And I love in verse 33, when it said, uh, I'm going back now to chapter four in verse 33, when it says, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. And I think there's something so important about that um, here, that apostolic witness. And and that's something that if you look back through the general conference talks, you're going to See that their witness, um, they are special witnesses, or even looking back at the living Christ or, or pulling up their witnesses. But as saints, we also have that opportunity to witness, to preach Jesus. And we love that phrase, preach Jesus. We yeah, love it. It's, yeah. it's just makes it feel so at home. And I love that they were doing it from house to house. But it makes me think um, when I went up to the church for my training at the very beginning. And they talked about what was coming up in the next few months and things that I should maybe put on my calendar. And and right away, I heard about this worldwide youth testimony meeting Mm. that is going to take place in October. And it just like a fire filled me that I was like, what a powerful experience to imagine that on one day, All of the youth in the entire world will gather to preach Jesus, Jesus, to witness of Jesus. And can you imagine? Think about a pouring out of the Spirit. Think about a filling up that could happen there as as we, just the same as they did, went from house to house and in the temples, and they did preach Jesus without ceasing and like my heart is counting down the days Mm. to October, to that moment of just powerful witness all over the entire world by the youth of this church of, I know Jesus. He showed up in my story. And are you excited to see what that's going to be like? Well, I'm just thinking about that verse we already read in Joel, where it was like, you are watching and we'll see on that day and have seen like another fulfillment of that prophecy of Joel that God will pour out his spirit in the last days upon the handmaidens and upon the youth and, and they'll dream dreams and see visions. And and to tell that story, like we might live in a culture where it's, um, uh, you, where, where you might assume that everybody knows that already. And so you keep silent or um, maybe you're just like, oh, I don't want to be offensive in, you know, in speaking this. But really, I, I think if you take their approach, like earlier in that chapter, they just said this. Like everyone's like, all the people are like, what, what should we do about this miracle that happens? We can't deny it. And that's what they said. Acts 4.19, Peter and John answered and said, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than God, you judge. <laughs> do you think we should listen to you or to God? We can only speak, verse 20, of the things that we've seen and heard. Like, I, I don't know what else you want us to say, but this happened. Jesus came into the story and this happened. We saw it, we heard it, we experienced it, and now we're going to share it. And, and you can judge whether it fits up with your theology. But like, th- it happened. Yeah, like, and, do, and don't you want to share those stories around kitchen tables and on walks with your neighbors and um, sitting on the benches of baseball games? And I, I just think to myself, let's become a people who witnesses of Christ. Yeah. Let's become that people um, that is preaching Jesus Every day, continually. Yeah, right. Amen. That's it's part of what that kingdom community looks like, right? It's yeah. a, it's 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 a, one of the ways, a significant way that we take people by the right hand and we lift them up, and and strength is mm. is given. Like it actually happens. Like you can strengthen someone's faith and resolve and courage by sharing those things that you have both seen and heard. Your infallible proofs, your witnesses of 
of who he is and, and what he's done and build that anticipation to see it tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next, you know, mm. so yeah. such good stuff so here, good. y'all. Okay. See you next week. <laughs>